Get ready to be inspired by the great things happening in rural education. The Rural Scoop will bring you new ideas and innovative solutions. We'll dive into education issues and we'll highlight what's working in your rural communities. You will hear from a variety of educators, administrators, professionals, and others who will provide relevant and engaging content in each episode. And now, serving up the scoop, here's your host, Dr. Melissa Seydorf. Well, welcome, everybody. I am excited to be able to talk to one of the Arizona Rural Schools Association's top 10 finalists for the Arizona Rural School Teacher of the Year for 2023. And I am really looking forward to uh, hearing about him and his rural school community and what he's doing with his rural students that he is responsible for. Um, and uh as I always do with these recordings, I have the opportunity to introduce my co-host, Ty White, who is from Wilcox, Arizona, lives in a rural community down there and is a rural teacher himself. So, Ty, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for having me. You know, I've gotten so much joy out of doing these sessions with you, Melissa. We have had some incredible speakers on and I, I think it's an opportunity to say we have another first today because I don't know that we've had any other people that come out of an accommodation school district. I don't think and we yet, have. I think that's a really vital role, not just for some of our communities, but like I listened to your podcast a few weeks ago with your researcher. Yep, Kelly and, Burns. And I, I think that this gentleman has got a lot to help us understand what that means, what she was talking about. So with that, guys, I'm going to hand it over to our guest today. Josh Adams, who's joining us from the Coconino County Accommodation School District. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thank you guys for inviting me to do this. Um, up in Page, you know, we're kind of like a lost, I don't know, it's just people don't seem to know where we're at or where, <laughs> where we're going or what what's happening out here. So it's a good chance to try to put Page on the map for more than just maybe Horseshoe Bend or the lake. So. And some pretty vistas near the Grand Canyon, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you here, and and thanks for being willing to uh, spend some time on a Friday afternoon, folks. Uh, that's how dedicated he is to rural students and rural education. So with that, Ty, why don't you get us kicked off here? So I'd like to know about your story. When did you know you wanted to be an educator? What did that process look like for you? Um. I really didn't want to be an educator. When I was in high school, like I took the ASVAB. It said firefighter, teacher, policeman, nurse. And I, I looked at teacher and I was like, no, absolutely, positively not. Like it wasn't even a thought process um, until probably after high school, I got a chance to work at my former basketball coach's uh, summer camp. It was a uh, Arizona sports camp out in Prescott. And I got to be a counselor and just working with the youth, working with the little kids, teaching them skills in basketball and how to improve. I, I kind of, that was my first like little seed that I could do this. I could work with kids. Um, and then like after that, I, I still wasn't thinking about teaching, like teaching wasn't on my mind. I went through NAU, I graduated with a degree, and I I, I should have changed my major to BSED, and I could have got my teaching certificate while I got my undergrad, but no, 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 I was going to just, <laughs> I was looking at places like um, Park Service, I was going to be a botanist for the Park Service. I had worked two summers doing that for the National Park Service. And then I was like, oh, I could do the forestry service. Oh, I was looking for Abbott Labs. I was looking for any type of employment after I had my degree. And I just had to, I had some really crappy jobs after high or after college. And I just needed something. I had a family I was trying to take care of. And that seed kind of germinated a little bit. And I was like, I'm going to go back. I'm going to get my BSE or my post back post back and teaching certificate so that I could end up going back and teaching. And that one and a half years of working as a hospital housekeeper, code reds, code yellows, code, those weren't fun. 
uh, cleaning those code browns up. I was the housekeeper, so anything the CNA didn't want to do, that was my job. So a year and a half of doing that just really dedicated me to finding something that I could call a career that I could see myself doing. And I got a chance to go and be a student teacher at the high school I graduated at from Cactus High, from Cactus high School. I got to work. My advisor for um, my sponsor for the all-star club that I was in in high school was now the principal. Mm. And I was like, oh, she's going to hire me once I finish. Um, and I got a job in the district, just not at her school. And I kind of fell in love with it. Just absolutely fell in love with it. I was able to coach. So I really got to do what I wanted to do when I had that seed. Um, I got to be, um, what else? Uh, I was a coach. I was a sponsor for different clubs. I just got to relive my high school days and I enjoyed high school. So most of the teachers I hear that are up here teaching with me, they either loved high school or they hated it. And mm -hmm. I definitely loved mine. And I thought maybe I could try to be a person that I had when I was growing up and try to help some kids. But it, it was a very, very, very unorthodox uh, approach. When I was in high school, I was going to be a pharmacist. I knew what I was going to be. Um, I knew exactly where I was going to go to school. I knew where I wanted to work. I, I, I made my major fit for that degree plan. Um, I was either going to go to U of A or I was going to go to Midwestern University. And then like my, my biotech teacher was like, there'll never be another cure for anything in this world. And that kind of like rocked me to my core because that like shut down every thought I ever had. I didn't want to make 150000 a year at the expense of some sick, dying individual that just needed their medication. I wanted to help people. And when I was told that it's more profitable to treat someone than to cure them, that kind of got my, my gears going a little mm -hmm. bit. And I was like, I just didn't want to be a part of the problem. I'm going to try to be a part of the solution. So maybe... Maybe if I become a teacher, an educator, I can change the next generation to not think of profit, but to think of people. Mm -hmm. And that I, that kind of really got me into got me into staying with it. I mean, this is my 18th year, and I'm still doing it. And I'm still having fun with it. So, so Josh, you mentioned that uh, you were able to start out in Peoria uh, School District, which is where Cactus High School is here in oh. in Phoenix area in Arizona. Um, which is obviously an urban district. And so <laughs> teachers have a choice when they look for their their position. They can either choose an urban or a suburban, and, and some of them choose rural. So you're obviously one that currently is teaching in a rural district. Why did you decide to teach in a rural setting? I don't know if that was actually a choice or if that was uh, <laughs> fate, I think. Um, after teaching in an urban district at Raymond S. Kellis for three years, I was given the opportunity to go to FLAG um, to work on this project crime. It was a PD, two-year PD program where we were looking at the effectiveness of BSCS uh, Human Approach Volume 3's curriculum materials. Mm -hmm. So we had like 30 people. We went through the entire book for two years. Then we had to teach it with fidelity um, I was able to get like 22 graduate credit hours for being part of that program. And then when I was done with that program, I was offered an opportunity to work with the Center for Science Teaching and Learning at NAU as a professional develop advisor or professional development um, associate, where I'd work with teachers how to become, or mostly it was how do I help science teachers become better science teachers? Mm. Or how do I help elementary teachers? not be afraid to teach science. Um, so most of our stuff was like dealing with math science partnerships. Um, I would go in and I'd do a little lesson on evolution, which kind of freaked everybody out every time you try to talk about evolution. Usually it was the small town rural people, not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it just seemed like it was kind of fun. And then our, our prof or our, our, what do you call it? Our, my salary was all grant funded and that was in 2008. So if you guys remember 2008 to 2010, that was a really bad time for education, especially when it came to like grants and funds. Uh, the great recession kind of dried up my position. 
And with all that knowledge of learning in Center for Science Teaching and Learning and actually getting my master's, I knew I only wanted to go to two places. And I was either going to go to New Orleans and work in the inner city in New Orleans, or I was going to go back to Page. So when I graduated from, N- um, from NAU, I had an opportunity to move to Page and work on the river as a lunch beach guide. We'd set up lunch for all the float trippers that would come from the dam to Lee's Ferry. And I got a chance for like eight months to live in Page, to, to be in the community, to see what we, see it, what it was like. And I fell in love. And I, I had that little thought in the back of my head, if I can ever get a chance to come back here, I'm going to do it. So when 2011 came up and my position dried up, my position dried up, there was only two places I wanted to work. I either wanted to work with um, African-Americans in uh, New Orleans, or I wanted to work with Native Americans in Page. And I went to New Orleans first. I did an interview. It was an all charter school system in New Orleans. They don't have public schools anymore. And they didn't offer me a job right away. Mm. Like they didn't say anything. They like, it was three weeks after that they even communicated with me. So I went on an interview with uh, Page High School and I had a really great interview. But then the tour after with Paul Ross Kelly, who was the former um, vice principal at Page High School at the time, he just walked me around. And while he was walking me around, he was just like floored by that I wanted to be here and that I chose to be here because I almost didn't go there. Uh, They had no housing. Like literally, absolutely no housing. So I was calling Paul nice. and I was like, I, I just can't work there. I, I I physically, I cannot get there. I can't bring my kids, my dog. I can't move my whole family up with the hope that some something's going to open up and I'm going to be able to find a place to live so I can teach for you. And he's like, no, 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 no. Just come. We'll find it. We'll fix it. We'll find a way. And I was like, it was very, it was very weird. I had the job. I knew what I was going to do. I just didn't have a place to live. Um, so I almost didn't, didn't move. I mean, it almost didn't work out. And for whatever reason, he found a way he found a, a colleague of mine that was teaching math that had a house and she was willing to let me, my dog, my family live in her house. And we stayed there till November and we started in July. Wow. So I'm living rent free in some random stranger's house. And not only that, she also met or introduced me to other people in her in her church group other people that i worked with there was another math teacher there at page if i wasn't at her house at 6 p.m to eat dinner and i'm saying monday through sunday if i was not at her house they would drive they would pick me up and they would drag me to go eat my whole family and they would not let us not eat there we ate a meal home-cooked meal every single night for an entire year like, where does that happen other than in rural towns? Like, I've never heard of that happening in Phoenix. I would never expect that in Flagstaff or Tucson or anything like that. Like, I was I was blown away. I was shocked. And it worked out. I mean, and the reason why I'm still here is because of those, those things. I mean, a small town, you know everybody. Everybody knows you. Like, it's just less stress. It just makes sense. I, I, I can't deal with traffic. I go down to Phoenix. You you guys wanted me to come down and do a little interview. I was like, no, I'm not driving down there. I'll do it over Zoom. But I will not. I, I just can't do it. I don't like being in large towns anymore. And it's it's all about rural life for me now. <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I don't think I chose rural. I think rural chose me. <laughs> and I kind of love it. I did. Isn't that a song in Wicked, like change for the better or something? <laughs> Rural sunk his books into you. I'm serious. They really did. I mean, it it was amazing. Um, just I, every day, blown away. So, uh, Is there anything else you want to tell us you love about rural, <laughs> rural towns and rural schools? <laughs> uh, my rural town is probably, I know I'm biased, but I think it's one of the most beautiful rural towns in America. Um, I am on the border of the Navajo Nation, um, one of the largest Navajo or Indian Native American reservation systems. I'm five minutes away from walking to Lake Powell, 
one of the beautiful, most beautiful places you'll ever see. Um, we have Antelope Canyon, where I think over 4 million tourists a year come and visit, and they pay like thousands of dollars to come visit. It's in my backyard. Uh, I got Horseshoe Bend. Um, they start charging for that now. When I lived here, it was free, and we'd just hike out there and go see it. Um, yeah, I. to me, this is probably the best place. I call it my heaven on earth. Hmm. Whenever, whenever I'm like stressed, I just go out into nature and I find my spot. Uh, I, I've got to add to that. Like I, that's probably true for a whole bunch of rural areas. I live in a beautiful place, but the part that makes Arizona really special about our beautiful places is how many of them are public. I, I know there's a couple of them where you're at that are not because they belong to the Navajo tribe and that's great, but there's other places you can just get out and hike through. Like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I'm with you. Rural life is, is for me too. <laughs> so teaching in a rural setting does uh, offer some unique opportunities and you've mentioned a few of them, but they, they potentially have barriers as well. So in your teaching experience at whether it's page or any other um, rural area that, that you're familiar with, what are some of the challenges that, teachers face in those rural communities and how have you in particular overcome any that you've encountered man i i don't know the biggest challenge i'm looking at is just attendance like just getting mm. kids in the building um once they're there then i'm actually capable of doing something about it but if they're never there mm -hmm. it's very stressful and i know that's not just in rural towns i know it's not just in arizona i know it's like worldwide but that's my biggest issue. Um, we don't have fighting. I mean, we do, but it's not. My first day teaching at Raymond S. Kellis, I broke up three fights on the first day of school. Nice. Like literally three fights in the middle of it. At Page High School, I think I've seen three fights in 10 years. Like those, those issues aren't really the big deal. It's just dealing with the effects of poverty. And that's, that's usually poverty based on trauma. And that's my biggest issue. And it and it resides in they don't come to school. A, they don't feel safe. B, they're on flight or flight response all the time. They're just living. They're surviving. It's survival mode. So no education is going on anyways. So that's my biggest challenge. How do I deal with kids that A, especially at my accommodation school district, my alternative school, A, I know 98% come from abuse neglect, um, just don't know when they're going to eat, don't know where they're going to sleep at night, homeless. I've had issues where kids just wandering the streets at night didn't even know where to go. And once they're in the school, what I like to do is I just try to make them see that I care about them. like mm -hmm. not as a student, not as a hey, you need an A or B or C, just like, hey, are you OK? Are you OK as a human being? What can I do? What can I help you with? Um, do you need food? Do you just need someone to talk to? Do you need someone to vent with? Do you need help with getting through? How do you deal with probation? How do, just do you need guidance? Do you need an idea? I, I just want to be there for them because most of them don't have an adult in their life that they can go to. And that that's just troubling to me. Yeah. So that's my biggest issue is like, how do I deal with poverty? How do I deal with trauma? How do I deal with kids not being in school. And I really just want them to know as a human being, you matter to me. And as if you matter to me, hopefully you'll start mattering to yourself. And I mean, my first, my first real experience at uh, the accommodation school district, we had a student for the first year, she came every single day, every day. She did absolutely nothing. Not one thing. She'd come, she put her head on the desk. And she would sleep the entire day. You try to wake her up. You try to get her engaged. You try to just get her to do stuff. Nothing. You couldn't do any. Right? She just wanted a safe place. And we knew as educators that even if she, if she does absolutely nothing for this whole year, she's in a better place than she would be if she was out on the streets doing God knows what. Yep. Yep. What happened right after that, that next year? She graduated with zero credits in one year. She got all of her credits because she felt that it was safe. She knew people cared. 
she knew that we gave her that year just to feel us out and not get in her face, not scream at her, not yell at her, not shy her for, for not coming to school or not doing this work. We just let her be. And then when she became comfortable, she finished. You know, and it's like all of our kids are like that. They just need to know that someone cares about them. They just need to know that someone has their back and then they're willing to work and they'll go through the wall for you if you want them to. And if I was at Page High School, I'm not trying to bash Page High School, but I, if an administrator walked in and that child's head was on the desk and I didn't go up and try to keep them engaged, you know what, you know what I would have been written as? Oh, you were unattentive teacher. You were, you weren't keeping 95% of your students on task, 95%. Like at our, at our place, we just knew it was the right thing to do. And I had that ability and I had that respect for my principal. I wasn't worried. So, I mean. Yeah, the that, relationship. That, yeah, it is. It's all about relationships. And until yeah. they know that there's one, there's nothing they can do. There's nothing they will do. So. You know, uh, I've said, uh, and part of this came from my experience in the charter school, that there's a role for these other models and these other types of school. And that you've got to use them so that you find those kids so that you don't lose them. So that's, that's a pretty powerful story. Yeah. And it happens a lot. Like that's what we deal with at our school until they feel safe with you. They're not going to do anything. So you've already kind of addressed this question, but I want to tease it out of you a little bit more. You talked about mentoring clubs. You talked about some of the things you've done. I want to hear about all the different hats you wear. I want to hear some specific stories about the different groups and mentor programs that you've used to reach more kids. All right. So it first started, um, I was just a coach. I mean, I, no one's just a coach. I shouldn't say it like that. But I, I was a basketball coach. I was a track coach. And what I learned was when you're in a different environment, kids – look at you differently and you look at those kids differently and you build a much different relationship than in the classroom. It actually builds my relationship in the classroom when I engage with you doing something you like as a coach. Um, my basketball players never had a problem in my classroom. I could tell them A, B, or C, do it right now. They wouldn't complain. They, they, they would get other kids to do it. They were my leaders in class. Um, so that was one way is just being a coach. I've coached golf. I've coached basketball. I've coached track. I've coached, let's see, let's see if I can remember them all. Uh, <laughs> oh, tennis. I've been helping my wife. She's a tennis coach up here. So I like to do that. Um, and then I really, in 2014, I started this thing at Page High School where we wanted to go travel the world. We wanted to open world views of our students in Page High School, um, especially our Native American students dealing with poverty. So we joined up with EF, World Strides, um, what was another one I did, Explorica, and we got with these companies. And from 2014 to 2019, I think we did 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2019. We did five different trips. And then I just did another last trip this last summer in June. So I've done six trips overseas with students like that to me right then and there. Oh my gosh. It was, it was day over. It was, it was, it was over. They, they respected me. I respected them. We came back to school. We encouraged other groups to go and to pick their own trips the next year. I mean, just watching students face when you walk into the city center of Prague and you, if you've never seen Prague, it looks like it's a big, giant Hollywood production. All the buildings look fake. They're beautiful, but they totally look fake. And my kids, just their mouths, they were like, like they've never seen anything like that in their life. And I was like, I lived for that moment right there. The fact that you just saw something that you didn't think you would ever see, and you got the opportunity to do it in high school. All of those kids that we have taken to Costa Rica, Peru, Australia, New Zealand, Italy, Greece, Germany, Austria, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Switzerland, France, Slovakia, England, Ireland, Wales. All of those kids that had that experience, 
seem to have gotten through life a little bit easier. Like it just made sense to them. Like having a worldview, it's not just page where we have this four mile square block and that's all you're ever going to see. And you're going to live here. You're going to be born here. You're going to die here and you're never going to leave here. I, I couldn't do that with my kids and my students to save money to do those trips. I had one student. Oh my gosh. She sold 400 Navajo taco tickets at $10 a pop. Wow. She didn't make all 400. She just sold tickets for a Navajo taco. In 30 days, she had her entire $4,000 trip paid off. In 30 days. Right? Because she wanted to do it. I mean, she was one that lost her passport, but we'll get to that different story. But no. <laughs> but it was amazing just to see like how you could affect kids in more than just a classroom. And that was like a huge, huge, huge uh, motivating factor for me. And once you travel, you're kind of addicted to it. And I, 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 I'm still at a point where I have two more continents left that I want to get to before I'm 50. And I'm going to take kids with me to go to do those last two. So um, nice. I've also done AVID. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the AVID program or not, but uh, I was an AVID elective 11 teacher and I was an AVID elective 12 teacher. And teaching those classes and taking our kids to the universities, again, just opening them up to opportunities that they might not have thought would, could be in their future. My class of 2018, I think I had 22 kids in that AVID 12 class. And I think 18 of those 22 have graduated with a four-year degree, either from wow. Durango, from ASU, from NAU, from U of A and many more that have just continued going down after the years as well. So to me, and just seeing it like that, um, the effect that you can have on students other than just being in the classroom. Because to me, the classroom's fun, but I, I wouldn't stay for 18 years if it was just the classroom. Like there has to be other ways to get to these kids, motivate these kids, encourage these kids, and let them know that their future is in their hands mm -hmm. if they want. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. So, Josh, uh, Ty and I talk a lot about the term um, rural advantage. And that means different things to different people, depending on their context and their community and where they um, feel comfortable and how things are going within their rural school. So what does the expression rural advantage mean to you? And you've already talked about some of those unique opportunities that you've had as a rural teacher. Um, is there anything else that really highlights what that term rural advantage means? Well, I, I didn't even know. I've never heard of that <laughs> that that term before. Um, I do see there's an advantage to living and working in page, but I like to think of it as like my Diné advantage. Um, we have like over 85% Native American students here and they seem to be ignored in the world. Like I've never heard anything like we'll hear, oh, we got to help the blacks. We got to help the Hispanics. We got to help. But you never hear, at least I never hear about helping Native Americans. And they're some of the biggest, brightest, most loving people you'll ever meet. And I, I just love the fact that I don't have to worry about, are they going to get up and throw a chair at the teacher or another student? I don't have to worry about them bringing a knife and trying to stab another student or a teacher. I don't have to worry. Like, I don't have those fears working in page. Like, I don't know why. But from those students, it's great. I've left my uh, my wallet. I've left my uh, my cell phone. I've left my keys on my desk. Guess what? They're still there. When I was in the urban setting, one damn one time, I left my phone on the desk. Gone. I called my phone in class. The student answered it in class, and then I sent them to the office. Like, I don't have to worry about that in a rural setting. Um, I know that they're here to work. They like to work hard. They do their best. And I love it. I, I love the fact that they show up. They have a plan to get something done. And I'm just here to help them get whatever they want to get done. To me, that that's an advantage. Uh, 
it's one less thing that I don't have to worry about that I think our urban or our city um, teachers might have to worry more about. Um, I just love it. I, I, I would not want to be anywhere else. I don't know how to stress this enough. If you're listening and you're thinking about rural versus urban, rural's where it's at. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> well, we would I agree. You, <laughs> I think you keep preempting our questions. <laughs> I want you to make that sales pitch again. If you're thinking about it. <laughs> That's true. That's true. What would you say is the greatest challenge facing rural teachers or maybe your district in particular? I know you said that you you're having an issue with absences. Yeah. And yet I think that's a problem that's pretty generalizable across the line. In terms of rurality, what would you think is a a major challenge that you're facing? Oh. Well, we are so rural and remote. And this is talking about Page High School, not necessarily the accommodation school district. My decade that I worked up at Page to me, it was just the travel. Like if I wanted to do extracurricular, our closest place that we had to travel to, to play any other sport or any other team was an hour and a half away. Mm -hmm. That was our closest place. And then if we had to go to Phoenix, now you're talking about five hours on a bus. I mean, those are issues that I think more, most rural people have. I mean, especially with extracurricular, I don't know about the biggest, I guess the biggest would be Poverty. Poverty is the biggest. I mean, and every issue that comes with poverty. So trauma, like how do I get kids to feel safe in my class when every adult in their life has let them down? Like, how do I get them to even come in the first day so I can show them how to, how useful I could be to help them in their lives when they can't even get enough courage just to go through the door? Um, to me, that would, I, I guess that would be the absolute biggest. And I, I, I don't have an answer. If I had an answer, I'd be a billionaire right now. I, I do these PLC to four PLCs and sell my answer to everybody and I'd be rich. But I don't know what to do with poverty. I mean, the biggest thing I'm trying to do is just let them know I'm here. And it's going to take time. I'm not in a rush. If a kid didn't get credit that semester, he'll come back next semester. We'll try it again. If he fails that semester, it's okay. We have until you're 22. We'll try it again. And it's just not being in a rush for them and just allowing them to dictate when they're ready. You know, that that's what I'm trying to do. And it seems to work. Um, this year, a little bit more harder than past years, but it's starting. I think it's going to work out that way. Josh, is housing still an issue for your community? Is that something? Because I know that across the state, many people are uh, getting involved in teacherages in one way or another, whether it's uh, repurposing older buildings or building tiny homes or, you know, thinking outside of the box about teacher housing. Is that still something that you're struggling with in your area? It is the most. It's impossible. We can't even get housing for teachers here. And whenever we try to, like we have a new development being built right now. It was supposed to be for low income, affordable housing. Their vision at the city of affordable housing is 478,000 for a three bedroom, three bath condo. Who, who on a teacher's salary, even if you had two teachers could afford that mortgage at yeah. 7%. So yes, housing is a huge thing. The biggest issue is because we're a tourist town, Everybody that has a house makes it a VRBO or right. an Airbnb. Right. So now we don't even have rentals for people. That is huge. I, I did see that, um, was it Camp Verde or Chino Valley? One of those places, yep. they started building like homes for their, for their teachers, like little tiny homes. We were talking about that to doing that here. We have the space. We could even have our students at Page High School in the construction trades build them. But our biggest issue is if the teachers lived on those campuses, they would have to abide by the rules of the campus. So telling a 22-year-old they can't have alcohol in their building because it's on school grounds, I don't know how that would work. And that that's, seems to be our biggest obstacle with going through with that. I don't know why we're not, because... 
every year, our turnover in this area, 60%. Yeah, it's high. So now you, yeah. So you have to come back and find, you know, housing for these people. And it's impossible. Like I said, I, I would not have been here if it wasn't for that one teacher that opened up her house. I would have still right. been in Phoenix. I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I think that's a real problem everywhere. I think Dr. Cedarf has highlighted some of the visionaries trying to help solve that problem in the state. Yeah, there are a few that are doing some things really um, forward thinking about teacher housing. And you mentioned one of them, John Scholl, who's the superintendent up in Chino Valley. Uh, they just... Um, had teachers move into those tiny homes that you referenced. So it is working. It is working, but it, yeah, it would be nice to see it uh, more broadly across the state because I know Especially it is an issue. If, if you want to get them in, they need a place to stay, right? right. Like Tuba City and other places, deep reservation like Chin Lee and Pinyon, they have teacher housing and it's okay. $200 a month. I have a friend working at Tuba City and he's paying $200 a month for his housing. I would, I'd sign up for that. I, I don't know who wouldn't sign up for that. So before we close out, I just got to ask, is there anything we haven't covered in here that you'd like to tell our listeners about? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I think uh, some people that come to rural that might have come from somewhere else might have beliefs about students that might be a bias to those students. So I would say if you're gonna be a teacher and an educator in today's world, you need to get out of your own head. These kids are not like you. If you would have done this, that doesn't mean they would do this. And I have a lot of teachers that are like, well, they're gonna cheat. If it an, I would cheat. And I'm like, mm, you can't think of them as you. You would do that as you. Do not treat them as you treat them as them. Like, what do you know about them? Um, and that's my biggest beef. Like, I just can't stand when teachers hurt students with their own biases. Um, you can't do this. This is too hard for you. Uh, you're sped. You can't do it. Uh, let's make it. E These kids can do anything if they're given the right tools and they're given someone a belief in them from someone else. They can do anything. Every single one of them. So if you're going to be a teacher, please, please check your biases at the door, learn about your students, get to know them on a personal level, find their strengths, find their weaknesses, but focus on their strengths and how you can help them achieve whatever they want in this world. And by doing that, you will change the world one student at a time. So that's those what are I, that's great words said. to wrap on. That's good. Yeah. One student at a time. That's it. That's it. Well, Josh, congratulations on being an ARSA top 10 finalist for Teacher of the Year for 2023. And thanks for spending part of your Friday afternoon before. <laughs> uh, at least I'm getting fall break uh, coming up pretty soon. So really do appreciate the time and learning more about you and your rural community. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure and I'd do it anytime. So. Thank you so much for listening to The Rural Scoop. Please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe, or even leave us a comment. And be sure to follow on Twitter at Dr. Sadorf. That's D-R underscore S-A-D-O-R-F so that you never miss a new release. You can also check out previous episodes of The Scoop wherever you get your podcasts. Production support for The Rural Scoop is provided by Chattanooga Podcast Studios. Find out more at ChattanoogaPodcastStudios.com. See you next time for more great discussions about rural education.